Welcome back to the Love in Dubai show. With us today is an entrepreneur from Zimbabwe who's grown so fond of Dubai that he's been inspired to use Dubai as the blueprint for bettering the Zimbabwe's opportunities. And by developing the biggest mall in South Africa, the Mall of Zimbabwe, as well as luxury golf estates, including five-star hotels, indoor sports facilities, and a championship golf course. So, welcome to the show, CEO of West Property Zimbabwe, Kenneth Sharp. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, we're so excited to have you because the concept is a little bit mind-boggling to us. What does that mean, you are bringing Dubai to Zimbabwe? Well, let me start off by saying the first time I came to Dubai was 1992. Um, and suffice to say that the biggest tower, I think, was the Crown Plaza that I stayed in on Sheikh Zayed Road. And it was a two-lane road at that time. And, wow. after that, and after that, it was just a desert. So I don't even know if they'd thought about the marina yet, but it certainly wasn't uh, on the cards, it's not visible in, in the palm. Jumeirah and Jumeirah Beach kind of was just like a wildlife park. So if I look at my own country, Zimbabwe, where we at, I'd say we kind of at that starting point, you know, we're at 1992. And then I had this love-hate relationship with Dubai. It was kind of like more hate than love for a long time. For the first two decades of coming here, I'd come here every year, once or twice a year. mostly in transit, and I'd stop for a day or two, stop over. My wife's like shopping, so as the malls got bigger and better, you know, the, the time in the malls got spent longer. The trips got longer. The trips got longer, <laughs> yeah. much to my, much to my dis- dislike. And about, a, I guess, during COVID, actually, we were staying in our home in the Seychelles, and we'd been in lockdown for almost a year and a half, and we had kind of uh, need, a need to go to a nearby city, so we flew here for two months and stayed here. And a lot of my friends um, who live here permanently I got to talk to them and see the other side of Dubai. And the most um, surprising fact about Dubai for me was the fact that it's the safest city, in their words, that they could live anywhere in the planet. So that was surprising. I mean, you do feel safe here, but you take it for granted, right? You don't really think of much of crime in, in other places, but it is a big problem. It's a social dilemma in many, many countries, including my own. So I think the first thing that struck me was, wow, Dubai is really a safe place. Um, and then the second thing that got me thinking about the whole Dubai concept was, if you look at the evolution of development, it starts with um, planning. You know, you need to have the right master planning. And planning requires the IP and the resources, sometimes international, sometimes local, uh, but it really has to be done at a high level. And if you look at Dubai, the planning is really good. They've mm-hmm. planned these city nodes, you know, you've got cities within cities, and they're flourishing and booming. So when I look at my own city and my own countries, Um, we've got nodes that we own of land, large portions of land that are, in some cases, they were completely unzoned, so we had to go through the zoning and planning. And now that they're all zoned, we can build these cities within a city. And our city is quite a big city. We've got like four or five million people living in the capital city. Uh, So the numbers are there, and we've got quite big portions of land, you know, several hundred acres at a a time. The golf course that you mentioned is 127 hectares. Uh, the other piece of land that we've got, which is Millennium Park, where the Mall of Zimbabwe is, that you mentioned, is about 250 hectares. And Pomona City that we're developing is 270 hectares. So we've got these big portions of land. What do we do with the land now? You know, traditionally, people would just come and zone it, put roads in, service it, and sell off the stands. But then that doesn't maximize the value. You know, what maximizes the value when you take it up the food chain from beginning to end and you visualize what the city would look like. The vision that you have behind us is the vision of Dubai downtown. So that started with planning. So with us, we're really investing a lot of time in planning, and we're looking at different models. And I really love the Dubai Dubai model, Mm -hmm. both with high-rise and with golf uh, estates and lifestyle communities is what we're establishing. I love the Dubai Dubai model because it's unique. It really works perfectly. So I'm literally bringing Dubai to Zimbabwe. We also love Dubai. (laughs) <laughs> but you said in the beginning that you had lots of like you had a love hate relationship with Dubai. What what do you mean by a love hate relationship? You know, I have to be genuine here and authentic. And for me, it's about what is behind it all. What is the substance in Dubai? Is it just this bubble? Is it going to burst at some stage? I, I never invested yet for those reasons, and I'm I'm actually investing here now um, for the first time. And we've been looking for a long time. And it's for me, it was like. You know, at some point, do you reach a peak? Look at the property prices today. I heard of a, a sale last week for 600 million dirhams mm-hmm. on, on, on the palm, just for a piece mm-hmm. of land. So it's 160 million US dollars for 6,000 square meters. It's a record breaker. It's a record breaker. It's a world record breaker, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the top. That's in the top five of any properties in the world. So how does it get there? You know, and how long can it be sustained there? And the more you look into it, the more you realize that it is real. And I must give my compliments to the leader of this country. 
um, to Sheikh Mohammed, who, who had that vision to see into the future because he was the one that actually said to his, his, his friends, childhood friends, he was trying to build sandcastles in the water. And he said, I'm going to build sandcastles in the water. And they said, it's ridiculous, right? No. But then the concept of building something in the water is real. Look at the palm. It's, it's all reclaimed land. Look at the buildings that are coming out of the sand. So the, the, the vision that the leader has is what really sustains the country. There's a saying that says, you know, a country without a vision perishes. And this is one of the countries that have a great vision. So surely it can't perish. So the more I've come here and the more I've seen the investment, the wealth that's been created, and the equity that's put in, you know, lot, this year alone, I, I heard from a property broker that 80% of sales of properties is with equity, 20% debt. In most countries, it's the reverse. It mm -hmm. could be probably 90% debt. So that, that means that the pressure on, on the capital here is much less. You know, it's comfortable, the capital, and can stay. It's permanent, right? So when you put bricks in the ground, and that's one of the things we're doing in Zimbabwe, we have this strategy statement to 2050 to put a billion bricks in the ground. And when you put bricks in the ground, it's permanent. It's a permanent investment that stays in the country. Speaking of putting bricks in the ground in Zimbabwe, um, and you're bas it's what's so interesting about Dubai is that we actually, there's a lot of little elements of Dubai which come from other parts mm -hmm. of the world. And yeah. now you're actually saying, actually, Dubai is amazing. I want to bring this to Zimbabwe. Yes. But if you are putting the bricks in the ground, like, who are you? Like, well, what, this is an amazing mass scale project. So I think we need to learn a little bit more about Kenneth Sharp and how you, the CEO of West Properties, What's the background there? How are you doing this? So how far do you want me to go back? Um, what did you study? <laughs> so we can take notes. <laughs> Which hospital were well, you born in? <laughs> yeah. I was born in uh, Harare, um, in St. Anne's Hospital. And I was born in the 70s, so in 1973. I'll be 50 in two months' time. How's that for a number? <laughs> party in Dubai or party in Zim? <laughs> Close to Dubai. I won't, won't give the, dis the exact location yet. It's, it's still um, 50 people for the 50th. Nice. So I think if I look back in my own life, growing up in the 70s and 80s, um, you know, that develops in you a certain um, desire. And my desire seeing, we, we were in a civil war at that time. So Zimbabwe, the history of Zimbabwe was, it was a, a British colony. Um, and the British colony uh, was separated from, from the motherland in 1968 by Ian Smith, who declared the unilateral declaration of independence. So Rhodesia, southern Rhodesia, became Rhodesia as a country and was run by the white minority government under Ian Smith. Um, and the black population, of course, didn't like that. And, and, and they started a, a war to get back their country, to get back their independence. because the black population is 99.9% of the people. Uh, and they fought a long war. In 1979, it ended with a settlement agreement, Lancaster House Agreement, in which um, the British brokered a, a peace deal between the white minority government and the new black government, and Robert Mugabe was elected as the first president. And of course, that's a whole other story because he stayed, he overstayed his welcome and uh, unfortunately was thrown out of power four years ago by the current uh, government. And... Um, As a youngster, I, I kind of had this, I guess, um, innate objective purpose in me that it was um, part of my future to be part of the society. Being white didn't mean that I wasn't going to belong for me. You know, I say to some of my black friends, you may have black skin and I may have white skin, but our hearts are both red and the blood we bleed is for our country. So I believe that it's, it's really not about race. Um, it's about, you know, what your... Um, desire is, and if your desire is to make your country better, better, then you'll go through all means and find ways to make your country better. And it just happens that I'm a developer, I'm in property, and I believe that that's one of the ways that I can make my country better. Mm -hmm. It's inspiring. Uh, but do tell us more about like West Property and why that's distinctive from other developments. So I'd say the first thing about West Property is um, our focus. We're extremely focused on the customer. And Dubai is a great example. It's really customer focused. I mean, where in the world can you have a development that's sold in 15 seconds? I'm talking about a whole building, right? Mm. <laughs> so We've they... seen the queues before they unleash developments here and there's just thousands of people, hundreds right. of people right. wanting to buy. It's crazy. So it's that yeah. hype unit technology, they call it FOMO, the fear of missing out. So if they, the yes. marketing side is really great. And, and that's about being customer centric. I mean, you go onto your social media and you see an advert, you click on it, you click on WhatsApp, put your number in it. I can guarantee you, if, if it's a good developer, you'll get a call back in five minutes. So mm -hmm. that's five minutes from the time you've seen the ad to where you're actually being serviced by someone. And they really take care of you and promote. So I think coming back to our story is 
um, in Zimbabwe, we have a gap. Uh, for a long time, we've been kind of in the dark ages. No development, nothing was happening under Mugabe. And suddenly the new government's there saying, you know, we're promoting business. We've got a vision 2030 to bring Zimbabwe into the middle class. Um, the president, cabinet and, and parliament, opposition included, we all want to build our country. So let's focus around the economy. So that's an opportunity for someone like me. You know, I was kind of also before then sitting on the sidelines. I've got other investments outside the country. And I said, okay, it's time to, to step up the ante, you know, to let's turn the volume up a bit. You know? We took our land holdings and said, how can we make this work? What are other developers doing? And we looked at it. And our, our value proposition that's unique is that we offer this lifestyle community. We believe in giving um, homes to our customers that where they can live in style. And not only in style of the building, but in style of the vicinity. So we create these nodes of, of live, work, shop, play. So an element of residential, an element of office, an element of retail, and then an element of open parks and sporting facilities. And it's those amenities and that neighborhood that's unique. It's very difficult to duplicate that. So you're planning on building a neighborhood and not just a mall, Correct. right? Like a full yeah. community center. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. But uh, if... If you're focusing on, you wouldn't just focus on just the retail and the commercial aspect of it because, I mean, Zimbabwe is mostly known for tourist, tourism destination, mm -hmm. right? Like wildlife, all of that. So uh, why, you know, like not work on that and like introduce a commercial aspect like shopping centers? Do you, you know, think the, that would the grass is always green on the other side. And uh, Zimbabweans do have a beautiful natural wildlife and habitat, but they want to have modern living. So the homes were designed largely by British architects and British design in the 50s and 60s. And they, they're a little bit boring. So we're bringing more modern designs. And that's one of the other reasons we say we're bringing Dubai to Zimbabwe is because the designs, the architecture is glass, stone, um, you know, marble, um, steel. So it has a more modern feel to it than perhaps what was being done before. Mm -hmm. We're talking golf courses. We're talking mo the biggest mall in the biggest mall in South Africa. So it's it it will be no. It's not the biggest mall in South Africa. South Africa has got well a, a huge mall called Mall of Africa now, which is the biggest one in Africa. Uh -huh. um, and the second biggest is in Morocco. So this mall that we're building in both phases would be this would be the third biggest in Africa. And what's the timeline for these projects? Like when are when are people so, going to be living in these? Yeah. Uh, so we started building. Homes? We started servicing the land about five years ago. Um, and we started Superstructure, which is the actual buildings, about three years ago. So currently we've got about um, 600 sold out of several thousand. Um, and probably of those 600 sold, there's about 100 units that are finished. That includes flats and homes. So we're getting into the stage now of um, seeing the construction come out of the ground more than before because we're finishing the superstructure, the infrastructures. Um, and those superstructures we're putting in now, and as we... Um, Every year, we, we're accumulating um, momentum. We, we're getting bigger at the numbers. So, you know, our goal is, is a billion bricks uh, by 2050, and we are about 40 million bricks into our sales pipeline right now. So, wow. four percent of the way there. Okay. So, I want to ask you this one question. We were uh, we came to know about like your incident that took place in January 2007. Oh. <laughs> Uh, when you, uh, you know, like survived a near-death experience in Canada while skiing. So what was that like and how has that changed your perspective? And is this something that's like your love and uh, motivation to do something for your country come from that incident? It did and it didn't. I mean, things do affect you in your life, but they don't really change who you are. And I think the ski accident was a, a big uh, moment, a precipitous moment where... I kind of had this, you know, aha, definitely on waking up. So the, the story is I was skiing in Whistler without a helmet, first time ever, and the ski instructor, a great Australian guy, who decided I could ski without a helmet and take me off-piste on the third day of skiing uh, with no off-piste off experience. Um, and off-piste is in the powder, so it's kind of knee-deep, totally different skiing experience to being on the slopes. I don't know if any of you are skiers, but, you know, you oh. can... You can carve on the slopes, you, but you know what I mean. Right? <laughs> yeah. so it's different. So you wow. can, I'm now in the snow, in the powder, and I don't know what's going with my skis. They, I just learned snowplow, but the skis are going all over the place. And he's going pretty fast in between the trees. Mm. I'm trying to keep up with him. Oh, Next no. thing is I hit a tree. Oh, no. And it uh, turns out I hit my head into the tree. I, I hit probably a rock, spun back, backwards, hit my head into the tree and knocked out. So I was out about three minutes. And then he woke me up and said, um, I think you've broken your neck. Don't move. So I was like, no, 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 I haven't broken my neck. So I jumped out of the snow and grabbed one ski out of the snow, grabbed the other one, you know, and put them back on and said, let's go again. He was like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is serious. I've got a medic coming. Just hang on. 
and then the medic came and he kind of went off on his own left me with the medic oh my god he just wanted a day out this he guy was just, he was just an what adventurer so the medic stronger? started saying you know we need a stretcher and i was like no no i'm fine i can ski he's like you sure yeah so we started skiing down and as i started to ski down my whole world was just like spinning around me and you know i was starting to hallucinate and oh, i knew there was something wrong with me so halfway down i said i can't ski anymore something's going on he looked at me and he said your right eye is dilated it means you've got internal bleeding in your brain we've got to get you to hospital oh my god and i just made it like hobbling to the ski lift and 12 minutes down in the condola at the bottom i was out un- unconscious and they took me to the whistler local hospital they examined me there was no fractures or marks on my body not even a cut but they knew that i had internal severe uh, brain bleeding bleeding on the brain they put me in an ambulance and transported me to vancouver lionsgate hospital and the way in the ambulance i physically kind of died um i remember lying there being incapacitated no no feeling so you know you go through a pain barrier that's excruciating you can't even describe the pain that i that i experienced and then you get numb from the pain and you just become your whole body's numb and you lose your your hearing you lose all your senses and the last thing i had was my sight and i remember staring at the the roof of this ambulance and seeing like shadows moving around me they were panicking you know it's kind of like dying and then the lights just slowly went off no. it was like a a light switch dimmer 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 and then just a little dot light and gone and that last moment i just said look if i can ah. if i can see <laughs> if there's a god up there just hear me if i can just see if if you can keep me alive and i just have my eyesight i'm happy to be a paraplegic in a wheelchair whatever there is oh, in my wow. life let me just it was the last thing i had right so you're desperately holding on to the little last piece of life you have and then it's gone extinguished So it turns out I, I went into a coma. They put me on a life support machine. Um the blood had bled into 60% of my brain cavity and pushed the brain three times uh, compressed its size internally. So they on, on arrival at, at the hospital they did a craniotomy, which is a 6-hour brain surgery to remove the skull. They removed this much flap bone flap from my skull to evacuate the blood. 7 hours of surgery and then sent to my wife who had been uh, oh, on the ski slopes and delayed coming in. and said to look we've tried our best to save him uh, he's got about a 2% chance of survival and probably he'll never come out of the coma if he does you know he'll be a vegetable and here you are today that's it oh my <laughs> miracle. god wow You're um, a miracle child <laughs> but it's great to be speaking to you <laughs> yeah wow so a man with uh, who at one point had 2% chance of survival and is now bringing you to buy blueprint to zimbabwe unfortunately that is the time we all we have time for but thank you so much for sharing that story i don't know about you but i'm shook shook <laughs> Guys, that was the CEO at West Property Zimbabwe, Kenneth Sharp. Thank you so much for your time and sharing that story with us. Thank you. Thank We you appreciate for being it. Here. Thank you so much. That is it for us. Same.